So it was 2014 and uh, I was a member of the 7th Special Forces Group. We go into the well-known Taliban hotspot where they had been popping rounds off. The Taliban were in these things we call them grape huts. I'm on top of the truck in the, the gun port. My last memories were like being on top of the truck and looking through my SCAR rifle. They would sit in there and just pop off rounds at us and they're just whizzing by my head and I'm, my medic is from you to me, we're on the truck together. Like from my perspective, it lights out. This is Dewey. He's our family pet. I got a funny story I'll have to tell you about him being we're talking about him right now. So yesterday, when the v, so the VA transports come to pick me up to take me to Long Beach VA where I do all my rehab and doctor's appointments. And this guy, uh, they're loading me up into this van and he decides to jump up and they already have a patient in there, this other elderly veteran lady. And yeah. she starts freaking out. And I'm like, I promise you he's friendly. He just wants to he thinks he's a service dog. I'm like, Dewey, they're going to be kicking you out of the VA, man. I better go grab your jacket and throw, just ride on the chalk service dog. My name is Steven Munitonis, the CEO and co-founder of Katsu Global. And one of our most remarkable Katsu users is uh, Joe Lowry, a Green Beret who took a bullet to the head in Afghanistan. So this is my helmet that I was wearing when I got shot right there and the exit in 2014 in Afghanistan and Jared Allen's autographed helmet, the one who gifted us this beautiful home. And his story of survival and recovery is off the charts. This is where it went through. It, well, it came out. That It never went through my skull. It just went through the front right, it traveled through the helmet and then came out the back because I have an abnormally thick skull. Combat tested and proven. I was a member of the 7th Special Forces Group and a senior uh, 18 Charlie or engineer sergeant on my detachment or team. And I was a late deployer to that deployment, not my first rodeo, as I like to jokingly say. They were starting to switch out the guys on the team. So like we had a lot of younger guys coming in. At that point in time in the conflict, they were starting to retrograde or pull all the equipment out of the country or pull it back to major FOBs or forward operating bases like Kandahar Airfield and Bagram. As a logistical, that was one of my subtasks as an engineer on my detachment. So I was starting to like go through all the property and stuff like that, but get on the ground, come in and they're like debriefing me on the mission that we're about to do. And I'm like, oh damn, this isn't good. Now what are we looking at? It's a Yarborough knife. They're serial numbered. And it's named after the Colonel Yarborough. Yep. And every Green Beret is issued one of these when upon graduation of the course. And we, we tell, like to take it with us on deployments just so it has a little history to it. As a soldier, a professional soldier, I was like, okay, let's do it. But my last message to my wife via communication was very benign, but I said, hey, I'm going into the hornet's nest. So that morning we got up at zero dark 30, as we like to say, it was pitch black out and we're all testing our night vision. We go into the well-known Taliban hotspot where they had been popping rounds off at coalition or US troops. And as one of the senior guys and engineers, my job was to make sure there was no uh, if there was IEDs, I spotted them out and cleared them for the team. So I'm on top of the truck in the, the gun port. I personally felt that I could get a better view of things and I kept our uplift or lower enlisted guys inside the safety of the armored vehicle, monitoring the scanning with the crow system, which is a remote gun system. And we get into a tick or a troops in contact. That's just the acronym that we use. My last memories were like being on top of the truck and looking through my SCAR rifle. And I was like, this is insane. My dad, Joe Lowry, he was a home contractor here in Southern California, made his own business based out of Long Beach and would do stuff like out in this area when it was way underdeveloped. And I would work with him as a gopher and this is all in my book too like I'm, you know as a little boy I would was watching him you know do con, con home contractor work and just looked up to him so much but he died relatively young I think he was in his he was 40 maybe of a heart attack it was my first year in the army I was serving in Arlington National Cemetery doing funeral details like throughout the days like so we would do funerals all day while there in Arlington 
Mm. And I get a phone call in the middle of the night, long day of working as usual. And, and my mom calls me, she tells me your dad's dead. And I'm like, she, she tells me this day that I said, fuck you. Immediately, my chain of command, you know, they put you on Red Cross le emergency leave, and I flew out for the funeral and everything, and got to be there all dressed in my dress blues, because I was doing funeral details, so I was ready to, you know, mm. and, you know, my stepmother tells me to this day, she's like, your dad would be so proud of you. There's Gustav Carl G's going off, which is a rocket launcher. The Taliban were in these things, we call them grape huts. They would sit in there and just pop off rounds at us. And they're just whizzing by my head. And I'm, my medic is from you to me. We're on the truck together, him yeah. and I doing our thing, as he said in my Purple Heart ceremony. He's like, Joe and I doing our thing, what we did best. And then he's like, I felt like fell into the truck, he says. Like from my perspective, it's lights out. When that PKM round hit my helmet, I was slumped over and fell into the truck. You're in the truck, you're leading the troops. How close were you when you just started to hear those rounds come by your head? Um, well, I mean, you see where that goal is over there? They were in a great pup, probably about, I would have to estimate about like that far away. So not even 50 meters. My last memory was turning to Mike and going, this shit is intense, man. Joe, any normal human, not a well-trained Green Beret, would have ducked. Right. But you just stood up there leading and taking it. Right, like a dumbass. <laughs> Looking back, I'm like, why? But it was like that bullet went right through that helmet. And from my- Kevlar helmet. Yes. So from his perspective, he says, I slump over and fall into the truck. And he immediately, as a medic, 18 Delta, Special Forces medic, goes to work on me. Put in a battlefield trach, which top neurologists have told me, they're like, the fact that your medic knew to do that is what saved so much of your brain matter. There's a part deep within our brain that controls our autonomic functions, like our, our breathing, our heart rate, all that stuff. So he had to get an airway in me in order to save some of that brain, you know, and my life. Meanwhile, he's doing all this. There's still troops in contact going on and higher up is they do not want to bring a medevac in for me because it's too hot. They're like, no, no, no. And he's sitting there with my life in his hands. And he, so he talks about this to this day. He's like, Joe, I had to sit on you for like an hour before they would bring a damn helicopter in to evac you. Finally, get, it gets good enough where they can bring a medevac chopper and to bring me out back to Kandahar Airfield or CAF Roll 3, which is the, ho the triage hospital. Of course, from my perspective, I'm not there, you know. I'm, there, but I'm not. I'm out. I jokingly say this to cradle Catholics, as it's commonly known, that I took the express route by, you know, just all you have to do is get a near-death experience and you can skip all the catechesis and all that stuff. You just gotta take a bullet to the head. My spiritual weapon, the rosary, has been hugely important in my catech catechesis or my education in the faith, that voracious reading of the, the scriptures and Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica. There's neuroscience behind this. Like you get into a, a theta stage, I believe is what it's called. There are brains, the brave brain waves of the neurons. And it's very powerful if you use it, right? So yeah, the guys all coming to say their goodbyes. And at that point in time, they were just saying, hey, it'd be lucky if we get them to Germany, which is the next echelon of care. But you were close enough to death that the men that you fought with came in and wanted yes, to say they, goodbye. Yes, they brought all my teammates in and anybody that was close to me to say their goodbyes. And then they gave me the, the Purple Heart there. There's I have pictures of them, the command and everybody coming in bedside to give me the Purple Heart, which they would assume would be posthumously awarded meaning I would have been dead. And they get really emotional about this. They were saying their goodbyes to me. And then, as I like to talk about it from a, spirit, uh, from a faith perspective, the Catholic priest gets brought in and my chaplain tells me the story. I got on the phone with him to find out more of the details because he was there. And he's like, Joe, he's like, we went, I had to hunt all over Camp Brown. And he's like, I had to go hunt down a Catholic priest for you. And he's like, I got uh, the, ca the chaplain, the Catholic priest in there to give you the last rites because my wife I guess was on the phone with them asking and requesting and begging that it happen. <laughs> Sorry.
somehow miraculously you make it through the night. You're in a coma. Now, how did they get you to Germany, being in the in the state that you were? At roll three there in Kandahar, I still was. They, you know, like I said, they brought the priest and got me given the last rites, and then I guess stable enough to get me transported on a C-17 to Bagram, which is north of Kandahar. But it wasn't guaranteed that you'd actually arrive alive. Right. And they get me to Germany at launch stool, which is, like I said, the next level of care. Yeah. And they do a, a emergency craniectomy, which means they remove part of my skull so the brain could swell. I was not aware of any of that going on. I was comatose, so. And then the next stage is from Germany to Walter Reed. Yeah. My former team sergeant, almost like a dad to me, he actually escorted me. He was a medic and he got to volunteer to escort me from Germany to Walter Reed. He's like, Joe, you, your ass had to spike a fever over the Atlantic. I'm freezing my nuts off in the C-17. The Walter Reed part, that's not so familiar to me. I know Obama came to see me and all that during that time. You're essentially out for a good month. Month in a coma and that Walter Reed, like I don't, I wasn't aware yeah. of anything there. I came to or emerged as it's technically known at, at uh, Palo Alto. Okay. And I spent some time there and then maxed out my rehab there and I was moved to Casa Clean where I was at Casa Clean for several years until I was medically retired. So when I came to or the technical term emerged from my month long coma, I was at Palo Alto VA in Northern California and the whole uh, Ebola outbreak was going on at that time. So I'm like, there, like anybody that came into my room and watching the news, you know, it's all I got in my hospital room, you know? And I'm like, how did I get the Ebola? And this is how confused you are when you come out of a coma of like, how did I end up with the Ebola? Was did it, people uh, rock they're, Well, room? they're all gummed up. Yeah, I'm like, how did I get the Ebola? I wasn't deployed to Africa. Okay. When we're sleeping or in a coma for a month, that is a lot of atrophy for your musculature. And like, I lost the ability to hold my head up. So like, I'm just like drooling on myself like I am right now, but I couldn't even hold my head up. So like, I'm thinking like, in my head, this is all how it was processing. Why'd they cut all my neck muscles out, you know? Did I tell you that I set the goal when I first moved in here to walk this entire driveway? Oh, right. Really? Yeah, oh, and then we did that. Yeah. Who was the one who told you? what had happened to you. I think they kind of did it over time, like the, through the neuropsychologist. So finally, when I guess I was ready for it, you know, they got everybody, or when they deployed back, redeployed as it's called, meaning returned home, they, the command authorized like the, you know, a visit so they could award me my Purple Heart. And I, you know, talking to the director of the hospital there, I asked, I wanted to be, and I wasn't able to do what I can now today because I didn't have these braces. I wanted to be standing to receive the award. And so in PT or physical therapy while I was there, all they could do for me at that point in time, because we worked from, you know, not even being able to hold my head up. Like I was seeing all that muscle at atrophied trunk control. And in my head, I'm thinking I'm still operator Joe. I'm like, when they told me your, your core is weak, I'm like, I crossed it. Yeah, because you were the fittest green right, gray out yeah. there. My PT who I'm seeing here, has got me, she's like, you walk, I mean, 800, I think she said 800 yards or something like that, and she smokes the hell out of me. I was well aware you were coming, you guys were coming and what you did, but I didn't know what, what you know, Katsu was exactly, but I was like, hey, you know, know me, I'm open to anything that enhances my rehab. That's always, that's a joke thing, like, I like to set goals for myself, and we're doing that trike the 10 miler and what was amazing to me is at the time and you know, what is this six seven years ago you had to record everything because your ability to recall information was very minimal at the time so uh, i would explain oh these are the cuts bands these have arms and legs and you would say say that again and you, you recorded everything uh, so i remember doing it on your arms and you were like hey this is pretty cool and then we worked on your legs we did a, the did it on your legs. We did it all in your wheelchair. Yeah. And then I'll never forget what you said. I said, Joe, can you stand up? You stood up and then he looked at me and he looked around the kitchen. He said, 
How did I get up here? Pretty good for a guy that took a bullet to the head. We introduced uh, uh, our katsu master specialist, David yeah. Tao. He flew out here. He, you and him were like two peas in a pod. Yes. You worked basically breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. I mean, you did everything that we had recommended to you. But your recovery wasn't like today you're here, tomorrow you're running marathon. Right. It was a slow, steady, gradual, steady improvement. Right. You kind of touched on it, the sleep. That's crucial in, in rehab. And, you know, that's, if you can get anything right, like my, one of my doctors, a neurologist, said, Joe, I don't care what you do in the rehab when I was at Costa Clean and just sleep good. You were dead yes. for all intents and purposes. Yes. And now you're standing, you're walking, we got your trike out here. Steven, what's the trike? It is a, a space age cool device that Joe trains with, but it's ideal for Katsu. It's unbelievable what you see. Yeah, we haven't used them in combination. Yeah. This is just that yeah. nearby. Always a reflection of his light because I couldn't do any of this without what he's done for me. That doesn't say that's not saying there's not suffering in there, but I'm blessed as St. Paul says in my suffering. I I can be blessed because I'm with Christ. I mean, I almost got to be with him permanently. Joe, you know, we first put the bands on you. We started with the low pressure and then gradually built up. David was out here working with you. I mean, we did everything from just a little bit of walking to walking on grass in unstable ground. Can you explain that progression? Amazing, I guess. I mean, that's the best thing I could really think of it because I'm like, it was so shocking with, like you said, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I do understand my body. And I was like, I instantly had a decrease in spastic, spastic tone. You talked a little bit about the sleeping, the, the, the uh, benefits of good sleep, good deep sleep. You do katsu, before you go to bed. You have here doing katsu as you're in the supine position in bed. Mm -hmm. And explain that process. I train passively at nighttime with my red light on while I'm reading. Passively means you're just chilling and taking it easy. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. You just have it running on your phone now. I mean, I used to have the tubes hooked up with the brick. That was something David uh, Carlson, the teacher, yeah. asked me about. He's like, Joe, do you sleep deeper and dream when you like do katsu? And I was like, you know, probably I think so because I don't recognize the differences before and after because I'm like, I can't really measure it because it's not, it was, I did it so, you know, I've been doing it so long. Well, even your left arm, you know, yeah, the, you've been standing here for quite some time. And I remember when we first met, it was clenched, tight, yeah, really, flexible. really tight. And if you wanted to use your, your left hand, you had to literally pry your fingers open. And now, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it, it just, that depends too. And that's something I always point out to people. I'm like, you can tell my level of stress by how this left hand is responding. Like, if it's tense, then I'm, something's going on upstairs. I always tell my caregivers this when they're walking with me, watch my left arm. If it starts to rise up like that, that's when you need to wake up and like look closer, you know, because I'm tripping out about something, neurologically speaking. Say that again, what do you want to do? Get that medieval sword, that, so that was my dad's. And I want to get that hung up on the wall. So Joe, what, what's really touching me, yes, you did survive, Yes, you've gotten to this point, but it's like now you're in the second half. Through your nonprofit, United Wings of Liberty, you're enabling and you're helping a lot of other people. When we give, we get. The Bible tells us this. The more you give yourself away, you'll find yourself. And I, I could not understand this. I mean, I've read and like read, and that's why I know now. But I was like, why is it that like I felt so much like better when I was helping somebody and why were all these people helping me along the journey and they would tell me Joe you don't know how much I'm getting out of this and I was like wait what just open your myself up I'll give the example of our veteran client just open myself up hey you know I pick up the phone for him and talk things through and he just tells me what's going on and we talk about it and that just gives him a release and somebody they because they open up to me because they trust me you know and i'm like that's what you know god put me here for so i'm like um, i accept that mission and i'm like drive on with it this is a, a joke but it's also a story that i used to draw back into whenever i was going through struggles and rehab there was a green beret or special forces guy all kitted up me and he had all his equipment on he's in the black hop helicopter 
and he's you learn in the special operations community you learn to like get sleep when you can so he was able to shut down and go to sleep right then and there. Copal up front of the helicopter checks the inboard alarm system. So the siren starts going off, wank, wank. Wakes him up from his dead sleep. He jumps up, thinks they're up in the air and he swan dives out and they're on the tarmac still and he knocks himself out. And the guy's like, what are you doing? He's like, I thought we were in the air. He's like, you don't even have a parachute. He's like, one problem at a time. Katsu equipment is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The statements made in this video have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Please consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new exercise or therapy program. This video is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or professional advice. Katsu Global assumes no liability for any actions taken based on the information provided.